I'm Coco Novak, author, show host, and public speaker. Welcome to season two of the Coco Novak Show. In this season, we're going to delve deep into what makes us human, relationships, stories of failure that we learn from, and stories of success. It's going to be real, raw, and relatable. So stay tuned, hit that subscribe button, and enjoy. Professor Stephen Scott, welcome to Tuesday Talks. Thank you. Thank you for being my guest. I look forward to our conversation. Me too, Coco. So, Stephen, you are a consultant, child psychiatrist, I'm so sorry, founder of Parenting Matters, president of the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, and what else? Um, a very uh, rich history. <laughs> uh, I've been around a bit. Uh, I'm a professor of child health and behavior at King's College London, based at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience, as it's now called. And I work at the Morsley Hospital, as you say, as a child psychiatrist. I um, was a pediatrician for five years, but got a bit bored sticking needles into premature babies and thought I'd go to what was then a sort of new frontier of child mental health and uh, joined a godlike character called Professor Sir Michael Russer, FRS, and um, worked in a clinic where we worked with difficult children who could be challenging and adopted and fostered children. A lot of people have gone into children who are anxious or worried, but I was quite interested in this group of kids. And we introduced this clinic, something called the parent-child game, where we put a bug in the ear of parents, got them on the floor and just coached them live about how to relate better with their kids. And I was astounded, Coco. I just, oh, what a difference this can make. I just thought, kids were kids, you kind of fairly benignly let them get on and bring them up. But the difference this made was striking. So I carried on doing that <coughs> all my life, really, and did various trials of group-based parenting, because one-on-one can't be do. And then during lockdown, <coughs> developed this online program called Parenting Matters to try and get it out to more people. Fascinating about uh, having the ear pierce in a parent's ear. Yeah. So interesting. There was actually a show on BBC where they compared behaviours of the firstborns and secondborns, right. how they... Um, how they uh, get their mother's attention if she's not paying yes. attention to them. Yes. Well, there was an interesting study by a social psychologist called Judy Dunn who looked at the amount of time children looked at their, <clears throat> this was three to five-year-olds, their mother, uh, when there was a sibling in the room or not. And when there was a sibling, my goodness, they were checking out how much love and attention the other one got. <laughs> There's always a competition. Was kind of, you know biologically driven to make sure you're being noticed mm, yeah. that was so interesting <laughs> so the slogan of parenting matters is love and limits yes so tell us first about the love part what does that encompass sure well that is uh, being warm and being involved um and this is really important you need both um not just only the love but the love means spending some quality time with your kid it doesn't have to be long they will it will clock up inside them it'll it'll warm up their hearts if you give them a certain amount per day of this and make them the what i call it making them the apple of your eye for 10 or 15 minutes and um that has great effects and you can also then give them credit and notice when they're doing good stuff that has an effect on their behavior too and it isn't just behavioral that they feel their esteem goes up Ooh. oh thank you yes i did clear up the table rather well didn't <laughs> yeah. I? hey i made my bed nicely hmm. oh i tied my own shoes this morning <laughs> this stuff all goes to affect their self-esteem um <clears throat> now the more recent uh, uh special thing is called sensitive responding this is where you are attuned to the child and if they're upset you you, you talk to them and meet their needs um you can be collaborative with them you can um if they're making a lego thing you can facilitate it you can say oh, maybe you'd like the yellow brick or something like that you don't take over control mm. but you help them by doing that and this is what leads to uh, happier well-adjusted children amazing i love the conversation of children and parenting i think it's really important a lot of my book is actually on parenting um because i have two <laughs> boys um and i've, never, I've got three boys you've got three <laughs> boys <laughs> We're not going to compete here, Stephen. <laughs> well, I wanted to go on for a girl, but my wife thought perhaps not. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't know how, know, how no, much no. that's it. Um, 
And um, let's talk about the types of parenting, first of all. We have four general types of parenting. Well, yes. In the <clears throat> early 70s, Dama Bunrin was a lady who had two dimensions. She calls them demandingness was one dimension and involvement was the other. Right. And uh, if you, so that gives you a four-way cross. And the four types, if you are high in your demandingness, um, I'll come back to say what I mean by that. It was called and high on involvement. She called it authoritative. And those kids had, in general, the best outcomes. Then there were those who were very demanding, authoritarian, strict, but weren't really involved. It was like, you know, the colonel, father, right. and that sort of thing. And those kids tended to be frightened, obedient, could get angry and resentful due to the control being exerted by their parents, um, not so well adjusted, could get into fights with other kids at school. Um, and uh, uh, having received, if you like, sometimes anger would then visit it onto other people, other kids, the smaller kids, sort of, you know, the parent kicks the kid, the kid kicks the, kicks the cat, as it were. Um, then um, there was the ones who are low on demanding this, but high in involvement, so they're rather indulgent. There's now a vogue for so-called gentle parenting. Rather than saying, put your shoes on for school, they say, oh, I wonder why you don't want to put your shoes on. Let's sit down and have a talk, you know, while they're getting late to school. I'm exaggerating a bit. Um, that can lead to a style which we could call permissive or indulgent. Uh, these kids are rather spoiled brats. Mm. They're little <laughs> prince and princesses. And you see, I've seen one this week who then had to go to a reception class and he just didn't know how to fit in. He was so used to, yes, I'm mm. the centre of attention. I'll have my worry, thank you. I don't have to fit in. Um, it's not that they may not be emotionally intelligent, but they uh, have difficulty fitting in and you have to do that uh, in life. And also they have more difficulty letting another kid choose the game rather than it just being what they want to do, for example. Um, and then the fourth quadrant is low <clears throat> demanding us, low involvement. So that's uninvolved, um, uh, which can go right on to um, neglectful parenting. And this isn't just for people who've got a terrible mental illness of parents or are just away all the time at work and just come home, put them on the tablet. I've seen some cases of what we call affluent neglect, mm. re really well-off parents. Uh, uh, you know. I talked to a teenager the other day and he went to a party in a very posh part, lovely flat in Hyde Park, the parents had gone away for the weekend, left 15-year-old girls on their own, um, didn't lead to good outcomes. And so these kids are uh, uh, a bit lost. Um, uh, can then, when somebody does give them affection and uh, a good role model, get over-involved with those people. I see this in my clinic in, in South London. The kids who are how neglected, then somebody comes along and says, nice male says oh i'll give you five pounds if you carry these drugs to the next door mm. they, they get a sense of identity and they're, 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 they're craving for affirmation and attention so it can go sometimes in the wrong way interesting and, and later on some of them end up with wrong partners because again they're craving for that affirmation yeah. and attention they don't have the esteem to say no 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 that's not me it's um oh hold me yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there has been some refinement. Um, so I think demanding this sounds as though it might be, you know, ordering people around. It's it's more being um, having expectations and setting a calm limit using calm control, rather behavioural control, rather than moral. I really want you to do your homework, or you you're, you're never going to get into that good secondary school, Coco. Uh, that moral control leads to feeling bad inside and less self-esteem. But if you just say, look, I do want you to do that when you've done your homework, then you can go and watch Bobby or Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I struggle to get through halfway through Barbie and I'm like, I, can, I can't force myself anymore. <laughs> um, and so calm control rather than moral hectoring control. There is more recently a fifth parenting style, the uh, really intrusive style, so-called helicopter parent. Right. Uh, Mondays is horse riding, Tuesdays is violin lessons, Wednesdays is judo. You've got to be in the top three in the class, do more homework. Very ambitious, but um, this really represses the individuality of some kids. And, uh, uh, and then they feel terrible failures if they don't 
reach their parents' expectations and aspirations. Interesting. Yeah, I coach a lot of children because I also coach tennis. And um, I've had tenure, I've had kids fall asleep on the court at 10 in the morning wow. from exhaustion. And these were right. six-year-olds, not Gosh. older. And uh, they go to such competitive schools that even at age four or five, they have to be top of the grade. So It's sad, isn't it? Yeah. Because their talents will out. And so I think the other thing in... Um, <clears throat> the sort of control but is is when to give it up and, and grant some autonomy i'm going to let you go off i'll set some limits what time you've got to be in by if you go out on the playground you can do this from mm. six or seven um but i'll let you go and make some experiments and try out and things like that we'll come back and we'll talk about it but but not but not controlling every single thing and of course we're now frightened of stranger danger and all that sort of thing so it becomes a bit harder to let children take a few risks um, and, but that that really helps them learn and uh, become resilient so that some of the other kids um, the um, indulgent ones when things come along they don't know how to do it they haven't had to cope things for themselves they don't have and you can actually help parents teach them problem solving well okay you know your sister has snatched the toy away you could hit her but then she'll be resentful with you you know <laughs> you could smack her with the iron but then she'll have to go to hospital so you allow everything to be thought through mm. what sort of thing uh, what, what solutions do you think we could get to and you can guide them if they're younger well we could share it we could share the toy five minutes each or something like that or if she gives me her toy i'll let her play with mine or whatever it is but you can help you can guide children towards solutions and, and that can be true if they're coming in late or not doing their homework and by involving the child in the solution, they're much more likely to own it. And you can then give consequences uh, if they don't. But rather than just giving them edicts from on high. I think that's so true, especially we'll talk about limits as well. Um, I think with me and my ex or their dad, I think parenting was the only thing that we actually fully agreed on right. somehow. Um, to the extent that when the kids did something, which actually I have to say they were pretty well behaved, but when they did something, we're like okay, so you know you're going to be grounded for this. And like, you can choose your own grounding. And so they would go, okay, so they would choose something for themselves based on what kind of they were grounded from before. So I thought that's so interesting. And especially the younger one was very emotional. And so when he was getting too hyper, the last time he did that, he said, I'll just go to my room now because that was his kind of punishment. Yes. So he took himself off, Yes. Um, came down when he was nice and calm and that never happened again. So really good. No, that calm down time thing is very important for us to, uh, you know, the inward now is emotional regulation, isn't it? Mm. Get control of your feelings. Okay. Yeah. What happens when parents don't agree or have completely different parenting styles? Um, it depends how extreme it is. Um, children can, they're not stupid. They're people too. They can play one parent off the other. You know, <laughs> daddy won't let me have this. You'll let me have a cake, won't you? <laughs> um, I was tried that one time. We sat them down. This is a family meeting. We yeah. don't do this. And of course, the, the more extreme, if they are um, separated and living apart, that's even more extreme. And I've seen sometimes <clears throat> the younger children might be five days a week uh, with the mother and every weekend or every other week with the father, who then feels the need to spoil them, take them to McDonald's and let them stay up um, for fear of losing them. This is the fear of connection, of feeling. If they, they're frightened, if they set a limit, they'll be rejected by the child. So the 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 obviously what you should try and do is sit down and say, we can go nine bells and hit each other, not hit each other, but scream at each other about other things. But for this, for the sake of the children, we need to be more or less on the same page. And you can do that. Um, there's... Uh, there is a thing called one plus one which has little uh, videos of how to look at those kind of things and um so some of the uh methods that we advocate in parenting matters um in communicating with a child also work with a partner i remember one parent once in a group said oh these techniques seem to be really rather good, you know. And she was talking about the behavioural ones. Do you think they'll work on men? And I said, yeah. well, they work on dogs and horses, so, you know. 
<laughs> just one step, <laughs> one step further. But but actually, listening, say, well, what do you think? Just mm. just just rather than uh, particularly as a man, I like to get in with the solution or something like that. Say, what what what? How do you think we should bring that cocoa? And what's behind that? What are you worried about? And you'd be surprised how far you can get. And you can say, well, okay, so we differ on that, but. Having a negotiation, I find, I mean, it's a f- helpful if one can broker it, but even if you can't have it. You mean with person. parents? Parent yeah, with parents, parents, between parents and parents. Absolutely. 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 Okay. And it might get into the way they were parented themselves and all that might start coming up. Yeah, I find that interesting as well. Some Sometimes you don't like the way that you're parent, parented, but then people tend to repeat those patterns. Why is that? Well, um, it's when you don't know it, uh, you, you just you just don't know anything else. Right. That's what you do, isn't it? Even if you didn't like it and you... Well, many, even if you didn't like it, for those who are conscious of it, they then say, I don't want to be like that. Right. And so you'll get people who uh, 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 were brought up very strictly are determined not to be like that with their kid and then can become rather indulgent because mm-hmm. they don't want to be too strict with their kid. Um, but yeah, no, it, it can get repeated, but... Actually, so what we do in my clinical work and so on is, 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 in an hour session, we might have 10 minutes, what I'm saying, coaching them how to do it. But then we do what I call the in the head work. Well, how did that feel? What was that feel for? Our well, I shouldn't be having to praise my child for eating nicely. But that's what you do. Yeah. And we say, okay, but it's not. Why don't you try it? Mm. And um, has anybody praised you at work recently? Did your boss praise you? Said. Not for two years. What did it feel like? Oh, it felt lovely. I felt more like pleasing than something. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Go figure. Well, essentially, a people pleaser. Go figure. Yeah. 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 Well, they, they need the attention of their parents. They'd be gobbled up by uh, lions biologically it, yeah. if they didn't stay close and, and get the parents' attention. Mm. So that's one of the paradoxes, though, that negative attention is more worthwhile to a kid than none at all than being neglected. Mm. So sometimes they will play up. Uh, yeah. Make say stop it and they'll start doing some because then they know they're in the zone. Uh, they may cop some bad consequences, but for them it's better than being completely ignored. So uh, that's what I call the attention rule. They, they will work for attention. Yeah, either one or the other. So it's kind of your choice yeah, what yeah, you want to yeah. perpetuate, well, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's better to have some attention than none. Yeah, because uh, I think it, it's interesting with kids. All they have all day long is to analyze you and look at you and kind of work you out. They don't pay bills. They don't. They don't have to worry about anything. So I think they're constantly looking at parents to see how much they can get away with. Well, get away with it, and what, 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 how much of a rise you can get from your parents? Because sometimes yeah. the emotional power of um, "oh, well done" and "please do that, Coco," stop doing that, Coco. You know the power mm. that the, 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 they really get them engaged. So um, we yeah, often do that. That's scary. <laughs> we often get people to dial down the criticism and dial up the volume. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's important on the warmth. Yeah, that's the love darts. Yeah, yeah, that's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And so, why is it important for children to have limits, or you know, um, yeah, limits? Children like to be contained and to know where they are. Actually, mm. letting them go off is quite scary. They don't know where they are, know what they've mm. got to do. So that's their own inner feelings. And then to fit in with the world, they need to have limits. Um, otherwise, they're they're just. Uh, Fully developed, actually. They, they need to get up on time, get dressed, and you need sometimes to set limits to enforce that. It won't happen naturally. Mm. Uh, this is part of socialization, not in a repressive way, not in a nasty way. They can understand and explain it. But if they if they don't have limits, then they are these, these yeah, these rather overindulged and they don't fit in very well. And that's not very good. When you follow them up into adulthood, they have less satisfactory uh, relationships with friends and romantic relationships and uh, are seen as uh, not very nice to invite <laughs> around. And the kids don't get, get less invited to um, their parties by the other kids. Um, and they're running a bit wild, which is sad to see, really. But interestingly, we have a free parenting style quiz uh, right. on parentingmatters.co.uk. <laughs> and um, you c- we find we've got about oh, 12,000 parents have filled it in now. Hmm. And 60% would say they are on the indulgent side, uh, uh, the more gentle parenting, listen and explain. I'm not against listening and explaining, but you also have to set a limit sometimes. Sorry, it's cool. bedtime. You've got to stop your video game now. Got to get up. You'll be tired tomorrow morning. Just gently, kept, gently holding their hand and 
I'm not using horrible critical words, but just yeah. well, heading them off in the right direction. And why don't they want to do it so often if it's 60%? Why are adults so reluctant? Well, for lots of reasons. Um, partly because they might have been brought up strictly. Right. Partly because there are now some precious children, especially I see it in IVF kids, kids who've had cancer and all that sort of thing, kids who've got a medical condition, epilepsy. We don't want to upset them. Uh, uh, some adopted kids, you know, came to the family preciously, don't want to damage them or hurt them anymore. Um, and then there's a philosophical belief in um, gentle parenting. There's a book by the BBC presenter Kate Sibleton called There's No Such Thing as Naughty, um, which encourages you to listen, which is fine, but you need to have the limits too. There is such a thing as naughty. Some yeah, people. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kate. <laughs> Um, be damned on TV then. <laughs> and yeah, what is the main cause of disobedience in children? Wow. Um, well, it's not just the way they're parented. It's both inherited character and predisposition and the way you're brought up. And you will, if you've had two children, two boys, you'll know they're different from, from, from the genetics. Yeah. Um, so that makes a difference. They're more likely to be disobedient if... Um, they have less, they're able to understand what's going on, a lower IQ. If they are a bit restless and hyperactive, they don't have to have ADHD, then they're more likely to be like that. And some kids have got a more irritable temperament. Right. They just fly off the handle. They're more twitchy and sensitive. Um, so they are likely, and there's a third kind who we've been researching a lot recently called the, um, in the trade, it's called the callous unemotional kids, the ones who are not very nice they're rather ruthless mm. they can calculate a situation but they don't care <laughs> and they can be nasty they can pull the pull the wings off insects they can kick cats um they can be cruel to other people but and we've done brain scans and they're, they're sort of emotional center the amygdala just doesn't light up yeah um and they go on to be well some have gone on to be rather eminent uh, politicians um, hmm, I thought you were going to say criminals. <laughs> oh, criminals too, yes. They, they have a higher rate of criminality than even all the antisocial kids. Some of them, if they're not that, they're very good CEOs. They, they can fire a third of the mm -hmm. workforce like that. And, and so these kids, um, and, and that isn't very, uh, it's 80% heritable. You can detect them age seven. And so you can have quite, quotes nice parents and have one of these kids, which is very disappointing. Surgeons, apparently. I think it's to do with empathy, isn't it? And I think surgeons have a high degree of that as well because they're dealing with high level stress so that's a bit different from just being made that way right I okay I, you're quite right i remember when i was a house surgeon um you would do biopsies and breasts and things like that and if it came you'd wait while they do a frozen mm. section if it came back everybody would smile but if it's cancer they just mm. get on with it you, you couldn't afford to indulge just as you say Coco. you couldn't do afford to indulge the pain really yeah um but uh, and and yeah, and surgeons are often action men. Mm. When I was a house surgeon at the Brompton Hospital, all three cardiac surgeons drove red Porsches. I mean, they were okay. <laughs> no messing. Interesting. But um, so it's it's a so what is particularly pernicious is if you have a slightly irritable uh, temperament, and then of course you're more likely to cop negativity, mm -hmm. criticism. And if you have that and you cop a lot of negativity, that has a particularly harmful effect in kids and means you're much more likely to get into trouble um, at school and later on with the police. Um, so equally, if you can then take these sensitive kids and improve the parenting environment, you get, you're going to see some big improvements. And what do you see? So is it perhaps, okay, so one part is genetic and their temperament. Um, another part might be that parents don't know how to parent particularly well so if you teach the parents how to parent does the obedience kind of rise a little bit are they or are they less disobedient oh they're considerably less disobedient so i've done i mean in this game for 30 i've done 15 randomized control trials where we give 50 or 80 parents a parenting course mm. and the others don't right. and see what the difference is one of the surprising findings i found was that um even without teaching them how to read with their kids, the reading age, when we followed them up 10 years later, improved by really quite a lot. Um, 10 points where, you know, 100 is normal, they were 110 and the controls were only 100 because they were able to sit down and get them to do some homework. Mm. So um, 
it definitely helps disobedience and also makes them the kids have a higher self-esteem as well they feel better about themselves sure they're getting some credit too they're getting praised for when they're doing well and they feel safer um so yeah that's why i'm still in this game because i love doing it and then it yeah. gives me great pleasure to see uh, families turned around and um so I can think of one family in our clinic where um, the parents were very laissez-faire and um, the child was running rings around them. And we did have to use time out, which is a, uh, to some people controversial, but rather like your son, going somewhere quiet. But if they come out, yeah. quietly put them in. When they've been quiet for five minutes, they can come out. And then you don't blame them. You don't tell them off. You say, OK, what are we going to have for dinner? Will you help me do this? Uh, so it, it, they've done their time, if you like. Mm -hmm. And this can have a big effect in regaining control. It's not just given on its own to be a super control. It's got to be combined with the appreciation and the special playtime. Uh, but yeah, no, seeing that, you see it and, and, and it persists. And also, I was able to persuade uh, the government 15 years ago that this has good economic effects. And they gave us £30 million to set up something called the National Academy for Parenting Practitioners and train 4,000 practitioners in this. This was, you know, wow. under the good economy years of Blair and Brown, and uh, then, of course, the economy crashed soon afterwards. So there we go. That's amazing. So when parents have difficulties, they come to you? Yes, they, they, they do, or, or they think they've got a difficulty with the child. And mm. So then, of course, there's quite a lot of stigma. I mean, you know, my parenting, it's a bit like my driving. I'm pretty good at driving, thank you, Coco. I'm pretty good at parenting. <laughs> So there is a lot of shame and stigma about this. If 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 in yeah. the playground or the school gate yeah. you're embarrassed by what's going on, um, and we sometimes tell teachers not to say, "Oh, uh, Miss Novak, could you come and have a little word in front of all the parents?" It's pretty humiliating, isn't it? So we actually train parents to say, um, "Thank you. I'd love to talk to you about my child. Let's make a time to do that yeah. properly. I'll tell you what I find works. You can tell me what you find works, and perhaps we can create a solution together, dear teacher." Mm. Um, because uh, otherwise it, it, it can be a matter of, of embarrassment and shame. Yeah, very interesting, because we'd like to all think it naturally comes, right? But parents, parenting doesn't necessarily come naturally. It, it does not necessarily come naturally. Um, one of my slides has, um, so what's the odd man out, washing machine, car, Wi-Fi, baby? The baby doesn't come with an instruction. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> and I would like to have more on parenting in prenatal classes. Yeah, very bad. Uh, in my day, it wasn't. It was all about, you know, don't let the evil doctors do a cesarean section and use the TENS machine, which is fine. But what do you do afterwards? Hmm. Uh, my kid wouldn't stop screaming at 10 days. I had to call health visit, even though I was a pediatrician at the time. So I just didn't know what to do. So what did you do? Ah. <laughs> uh, Burp in rocket right. changes not the, not not rocket science. No, it's. I think it's important to have um, classes and courses on on raising children. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like a little tweak and makes such a difference instead of. Um, and then I would actually have it. Uh, I mean, there are a few things that happen in schools. You know, in sixth form, even boys. Sorry to be I make a gender statement. Are quite interested in child rearing and mm. babies. And you, there's a thing called roots of empathy, where you actually bring a baby into the class, mm. and it can be yeah. part of personal health and sexual education. Yeah, it should be. It's um, uh, two parents. Right? Terribly important. Mm. And I, what I'm struck by is when you look at the longitudinal studies, you measure, you can do a little task where you just say, could you play with your child? Um, and then first of all, just play naturally, then help your child make a Lego task and see how much the command rate goes up, and then finally get them to tidy up the toys, which can evoke some difficult behavior. But if you measure sensitive responding age three and then follow them up, one big American study of a 1,000 kids to age 33, the more sensitive responding, they were earning more money, they had better romantic and trusting relationships, they got a higher education, better degrees. So it, it makes such and controlling for everything else. What happens, so fascinating, what happens when parents get divorced? There is a study done that before anyone gets divorced, everyone would take, you know, take decisions that are best for the children. But then what happens once you're in divorce procedure, the children become kind of a thing to bargain with and pawns in the game to the point where oftentimes they feel suicidal, the children. Um, what can we do to not use children in our own games as adults? I do see quite a bit of that. And um, I mean, obviously, 
often after the divorce, the hurt in each party for whatever went wrong in the relationship mm. can become very big. They can become competitive, wanting the love and attention of the child. And all too often you see people bad-mouthing the other partner. Mm. And then they've got to have split loyalties. And at worst, you have things called so-called parental alienation syndrome, where they so bad mouth the other parent that uh, the child has to take sides and doesn't even talk to the other one. Wow. And I've got a case of that at the minute. And, and, it, and it's terribly sad. Um, I think we need to acknowledge the pain that happens in divorce and, 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 and the very strong emotions of anger with the ex very often might be resentful because they're rejected or one of them had an affair or whatever it was. Um, it, it, it's, I see it, a lot of pain once you dig beneath mm. the surface and sometimes getting that out and saying, look, you're just not helping your kid by doing that. Uh, can we talk about this? Uh, can lead to improvement quite often. But I think if you just keep it dry saying, oh, you must agree, I, I think... Um, in my experience, you have to get the strong passions underneath and make them realize what they're doing. And do they? Some. <laughs> is there a difference between men and women manipulating with children? Or is it more who was left? Well, I think it, it's... No, I don't think... I think it can happen both ways. I think... I th Statistically, I would say men are more likely to have an affair. Mm. Um, you might there's something behind it of being rejected and ignored and whatever. There's usually a reason for it, usually. Not just for shagging everybody in sight. Um, <laughs> uh, but, and so I sometimes see, I would see more often women saying, but I, I'm, this isn't a study I've done, mm. that, that, that he's a bad man, you know. No, I would agree with you just from people around me, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's what I would see in my clinical practice. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Interesting. So, when you have more than one child, we've already touched a little bit upon that. They're different characters. So I have two Absolutely. boys, completely different characters. Yes. What is the challenge in raising them similarly or differently? So, for example, let's take the curfew. So my older son, actually, when my youngest son started going out, I would say to him, so when are you coming back? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, no, you definitely know. So I gave him a curfew. And then my older son asks me, did I ever have a curfew? And I'm like... Well, no, because you always told me when you're going to come back and you always came back whenever you said that. So, you know, one didn't have a curfew, one did because they're just not the same. Um, how do we adjust for that when you have two different children, yeah. which I'm guessing, you know. So the usually... old adage used to be, I'm proud to bring my children up the same, but now I'd say I'm proud to bring up my children a bit different. Yeah. Um, but I think, again, it we actually coach people and after a family meal having a family meeting to discuss that kind mm. of thing because they you know fairness is very big for us as adults and for children sure. so they need to understand that they've got to be in by a certain time and if one of them isn't then we'll help you help you <laughs> yeah, exactly. get in time for your own good mm. and uh, the kids will do that when you, i talk to one and they say well actually i think my parents you know, uh, i don't like what they're doing but i think they're doing it for my own good they mm. can attribute benign intentions to parents and they will appreciate that fairness. But, yeah, so some kids, you know, will need very firm limits or time out, and the other one might not because you can you can just jolly them along. And I think kids will get that as long as it's fair, as long as the mm. overarching concept is fair. Uh, if you're going to give one three times as more pocket money than the other, you will not be a popular person. <laughs> so those overarching rules have got to be the same, I think. But actually... Uh, and they, they see what's going on. They'll say, oh, so-and-so, you know, he does mm -hmm. come in late, doesn't he? I can understand why you did that. I think if the love, whilst expressed differently, is overall equal um, and the rules are the same, that's fine. It is more difficult when, for example, the playing up kid inevitably gets lots more attention. The neglected kid mm. can get quite resentful. And I not infrequently see when the difficult kid gets better and gets under control, suddenly the parent realizes that the other one was doing some naughty stuff, but they hadn't, <laughs> hadn't been attending to it. Yeah. What was really interesting um, is when I had my second son, who, who, who cried way more. The first son was actually quite a calm baby. 
And when the other one cried, of course, I would go and take care of the crying one. But then the older one, who's now got a sibling in the house, would just kind of sit there. And then my ex said, why don't you just like spend time with the older one who will appreciate and understand? That one's not going to remember anything anyway. He has, you know, just been born. And then the older one would say, yeah, just go and take care of that one, mommy. It's okay. So he kind of gave permission Okay, but it's still nice to do the good stuff. It, it does all go inside. You're 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 investing in a building. You're putting money in the bank. So I think yeah. I think I would agree with your ex. If you if you, it's so busy when you've got young children. It's yeah, like, uh, but you can't let the older one kind of feel that um, no, it's just the third no. wheel now, and you've got something no. more important. No, I, I think I think that's that's good advice from your ex. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm watching my. I have to say, I enjoyed raising my two boys. <laughs> They're quite old now. No, I, I think I think that is that is quite important. Um, and otherwise, you get a lot of resentments, uh, uh, um, which can carry on. I mean, I, I my parents weren't very. I remember, ooh, the other day, twenty years ago, at Christmas, going back to uh, my father had died, my mother, and saying, um, you know, oh, this is where I was skiing, and then my older brother's tennis came there, and this is where we went on some holiday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wanted to get my mother's attention. Age fifty. I know it never ends, right? <laughs> so you can get a bit infantilized when you go home for Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sure. So we were both a bit surprised, what was <laughs> lurking in our in ourselves. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. Um, do you think we always keep an inner child? Yes, absolutely. So one of the studies we did, you know, there's this concept called attachment, which is if you do the sensitive responding and listen, uh, your child will come to you when the chips are down, when they're frightened, ill, upset. They will come and as a baby, you get, mm, you have that lovely comforting. You can see the sort of hormones getting better and more relaxed and uh, all the endorphins being released, the adrenaline and cortisol going down. Lovely. But if you carry on with that, and that's why I'm big on, by the way, talking at family meal times, showing your child they're being listened to, um, that that will help make them uh, more secure, mm. which is a really important construct um, to have that kind of attachment. We did a study where we looked at in adolescence, um, we videotaped the parent and the adolescent child talking about some ordinary things. Uh, you've got five hundred pounds a weekend. Let's see. Why don't you talk to your lesson about how you're going to do it? You know, some parents say, "Right, we're going to do this," and the parents say, "No, I want to do that." How can they negotiate it? Then we go on to hot topics. Five minutes each. What's the most annoying thing about your mother? <laughs> and what's the most annoying thing about that? And again, it's how they could be with each other. And we then separately took the child away and asked them about whether they felt they could go to their parent if they were upset if they had something on their mind or they're ill and to give examples not just a general thing so we then categorized them as securely attached which they felt they could go uh, dismissive oh no it's fine I, I just never go and, and then ambivalent or sometimes yes sometimes no I'm still quite angry with them about mm. this and, and sensitive responding at the moment in the 15 year olds was important in predicting but we had uh, clips of them when they were four and five and that added to the prediction of secure attachment. So that's an actual evidence that they were carrying around something of what they were like, mm. how they were treated earlier. So attachment wasn't just a readout about how they're being treated now, but so it yeah, looked another way. Yeah. If they've had good stuff earlier, even if it's getting a bit worse um, now, the good stuff will have a good effect. But vice versa, if it was all horrible to begin with, it, it is less good to have you that that can hang on a bit although actually i did a study of, of fostered kids who had a terrible time and they if they've had six months with a very positive um foster parent they were securely attached to the foster parent as, as typical kids were mm. to their birth parents so it's not all over by no. two or three there is always room you can learn to love again i think it's a really good point that you made by two or three so what is the time or age when we're actually bringing up children like how quickly is that over because i read that kids by the time they're three or four that's that's your job done kind of do they trust you are they attached to you do they have a positive kind of view of you no it's not all done the brain goes on developing it goes on developing till you're 25 yes it's important to put in the good stuff but it's not all over and that's what we've seen so we one of our studies was to put together 
people who did a, a particularly good parenting course um, of 1,800 kids and see if we got more improvement if they got in early at three than all the way up to 12. The improvements were the same. Oh, wow. So okay. it's not too late. Teenage is another matter. Right. It's very hard through parenting to make much effect on mm. teenagers. If they've got into difficult ways, um, it's hard. If they felt rejected and not, we are talking about earlier, this positive regard for things, and they start hanging out with a bad crowd, or they just go off on their own, and they get peers so that, a guy called Gerald Patterson in the States put little microphones which turned on every five minutes every hour randomly and the antisocial kids just got into anti oh and then I hate him and then I, I I mugged him oh did you oh that's great well did you really you know oh I got their mobile phone at the bus stop yeah they reinforce themselves for this identity of being a tough guy and a negative thing and it's quite hard if I had my time again I'd be doing peer group not parenting group interventions no, for this group okay. because getting their peers think is not a cool thing to do. Mm. But you still go on having an effect. So one of my colleagues did a study on why people didn't take drugs. Um, and they were often, number one reason, because my parents would disapprove. And these are teenagers. So so you might not think it's going in. No, no it is. Because my kid said as well, it's respect. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and education as well. And how to say no. We did a thing of coaching kids how to say no, uh, as well as knowing that they're mucking out their beautiful brains. Very true. <laughs> and now, you know, with skunk being very different these days with the huge amount of uh, THC and not much CBD, the 50% uh, of uh, psychosis admissions where I work in the Morsley are related to um, skunk and serious cannabis. So is it a precursor for harder drugs? Uh, can be. Not necessarily. No, lots of people just take that, and and um, you know, and are happy with that. A lot of alcoholics start off by drinking water. It doesn't mean to say it. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying, Stephen? It doesn't mean to say that water is a terrible, <laughs> dangerous thing, but it can do mm. in these groups. Yeah, who, who are unhappy and who just fall in with a bad um crowd. Just go and see back to black. That uh, biopic of Amy Winehouse. Yeah. Uh, she got in with the bad guy Blake and uh, yeah just more and more and more mm. and again there are no limits on them a lot so many rock stars are dying of drug overdoses it's it's and so young How's very that, sad right? whether it's Michael Jackson or um John Burt Whistle the bassist in the who Prince. he was my hero he was such mm. an energetic young man and then he died in a hotel room in the states and uh, <laughs> He wasn't so heroic then. <laughs> the hooker was with him in the room. <laughs> he took a lot of drugs, couldn't get it up, and had to take out his hearing aids. I thought, no, no, that's not how I... That's not how you want to end up. That's not how I want to end up. <laughs> um, it's even kind of towards the end of our conversation. Yes, sure. um, are there any other longitudinal studies that you've done or something that I haven't asked you but you think it would be really interesting for our viewers and listeners to know? No, I think there's a lot of interest now in screen time. And I think it's a mm. bit, you know, some of the, they can't have screens or whatever. I think it's, you know, you, you, you can be a bit more nuanced about this. A lot of kids learn stuff, keep in touch mm. with their grandma, learn about volcanoes on the internet. So it's having a close enough supervision. And uh, I would, uh, there was a Royal College of Pediatrics uh, recommendations. I would say you know whatever age it's going to be not more than an hour in the week and maybe two hours at weekends mm. because also you when they're if they're on the screens all the time they're not doing other stuff they're not learning to get on with their brothers and sisters or their friends so i think that's quite important no i think we've covered quite a lot coco and i would say that um you can learn this stuff and and that is why we developed our parenting matters website so that people to get it out there yeah, yeah, very important. Stephen, thank you so much for your time. It was it's been a such pleasure. a pleasure. It's gone so quickly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> thank you so much. I hope to have you back soon. Maybe another topic. Pleasure. <laughs> we'll talk on ADHD or something. Yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs>